A couple of years ago, I received a uh, surprising invitation. Some friends of mine are uh, clergy in Charlottesville, Virginia, and they said to me, uh, sent me an email, and they said, listen, uh, we've had a, a number of Ku Klux Klan rallies here in Charlottesville. I didn't know this, but they, they said that apparently there's a group of people who are planning the next civil war, and they would like Charlottesville to be the capital of the new Confederacy. And they said, in a couple of months, there's gonna be a big rally here. They're gonna to bring together a, a group of uh, uh, white supremacist and neo-Nazi groups and have a big rally here in our town. And we have a lot of uh, African-American folks and uh, Latino folks, and uh, we have uh, an immigrant community here, and we know that they're going to be very frightened uh, by these folks who are showing up. We just learned, my friend said, that a militia group from Pennsylvania is coming down. There's going to be lots of guns here, and it's going to be a dangerous time. And some of us in the clergy just feel we can't let this happen in our town without us making a stand and saying to the, to the folks who are threatened by these white supremacists, that we, the clergy, stand with you, and we stand for peace, and we stand for love, and we aren't going to let our city be taken over by these folks without having a counter presence. And they said the problem is we've been able to have a lot of uh, uh, clergy of color who are courageously willing to make a stand on, on this weekend, and we've had a lot of female white clergy who've been willing to come, we're having a hard time finding white male clergy to come. And so they said, uh, we're desperate. Any chance you could fly up and be with us for that week? Well, how can you say no to an invitation like that? Uh, although I, I must admit, uh, she's since forgiven me, but I didn't tell my wife any of the details of what was bringing me to Charlottesville because she would have been too nervous. And I, I must say, it was one of the most uh, scarier moments, really, scarier experiences of my life, to be surrounded by that many people carrying guns uh, and to see things I never thought I'd see in my life. In an American city, see people carrying uh, guns and baseball bats and torches and Confederate flags and Nazi flags, swastikas, walking down streets. It was a, a Stunning day, I'll never forget. Uh, a couple weeks later, I was back at my home church, and uh, the pastor at my church, uh, just in passing in his sermon, said, um, you know, Brian here was up in Charlottesville a couple weeks ago as part of the clergy response. And he just said that in passing. As soon as the service was over, an older gentleman came up to me and he got right in my face. And he said, I do not respect what you did. I think you were wrong to do that. And he just gave me this lecture and kind of read me the riot act in the aisle of the church. When I hear this passage today, where Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. I remember how I felt that weekend and how I felt in the aisle of my own home church to realize that Jesus' work as peacemaker often makes things worse before they get better. You know, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is celebrated and respected today, but you know what they called him. They called him an agitator and a communist. They felt that he was pushing too hard, too fast, he was one of the most hated men in America. So when Jesus says, uh, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and I'm under so much stress until it's accomplished, I understand from being where I was that weekend in Charlottesville and from standing in the aisle of my own home church, having this man right in my face who didn't even know me but was furious at me, I, I understand when you are going to address the things that make for peace, address the underlying injustices, the underlying unacknowledged prejudice and hate and evil and fear that's lurking in people's hearts, they're not going to say, oh, thanks for telling us. Thanks for helping us see that we're racists. 
thank you so much. We'll be glad to change. No, there's going to be a pushback. There's going to be, there's going to be uh, counterattack. So Jesus says, listen, don't think that my coming is going to make everything nice and rainbows and roses and all the rest right away. He said, look, in the short run, there's going to be trouble. And the trouble is going to be in the family. And the trouble is going to be between the older generation and the younger generation. Fathers, sons, mothers, daughters, mothers, daughter-in-laws, daughters, mother-in-laws. It's going to be a generational conflict. The people who are used to the old way will dig in their heels. And the younger people, and it was mostly, we have to remember, Jesus was 33 as a movement leader. In all likelihood, his followers were younger than he was. Many of them at any rate. Probably we would have called what Jesus did, a youth movement. And Jesus says, look, the things I'm doing are going to really make some people upset, especially maybe the older generation, who's used to things being the old way, and now I'm coming unsettling things. You think about the struggles in our world today. We're still dealing with issues of race. We're still, still dealing with treating men and women as true equals. We're still struggling and dealing with how to acknowledge our LGBTQ children and parents and neighbors and siblings and friends. We're, we're still struggling with what we're going to do about our entire ecosystem that has been shifted out of balance by our economic system. And we've got to know that in this moment, if we stand with Jesus and do the work of Jesus, we're not just going to have everybody saying, oh, thank you. Thanks for telling us that we need to change from dirty energy to clean. Oh, thanks for telling us that we've got to confront our old assumptions about race or gender or whatever. Oh, thanks. We'll be glad to change. No, it's not going to happen. People are going to be upset. When Jesus came, he was not a pacifier. He was not a law and order dominator. We're going to bring peace by making everybody knuckle under. He was an agitator. He was a fire starter. He knew that things had to heat up before people would wake up. He knew that as the Prince of Peace, you can't produce and bring real peace without bringing justice. And justice is about power. And so far in human history, not many people besides Jesus who have given up power willingly. And so confrontation comes. Things heat up. It was true in Jesus' day. It's true in our day. Sometimes things have to get worse before they can get better. That's probably true in our lives. You know, there might be things that I'm unwilling to face, and the pressure has to heat up to get me humbled to the point and reduced to the point where I'm willing to face some uncomfortable personal truths. But it's true in our religious communities. Sometimes our communities are living in our own spiritual la-la land where we aren't really willing yet to face reality. And things might need to get worse if we're not ready to face reality. It happens in nations. It happens in political parties. It happens in civilizations. Jesus comes along and tells the truth, and he prepares us. He says, listen, it's not going to be easy. Things might get worse before they get better. We might have to heat things up and stir things up before we can wake people up. Amen.